So hello everybody, this is the Linux in Practice course 2 of the HS15 of the Linux state of thealternative.ch. This recording was made at home since I was not very happy with what I told in the course. I was rather confused due to reasons related with my studies and I was not able to put clear points as well as I wanted to. So parts of this lecture have been replaced by the recording I'm doing at home right now. So we are talking about upward redirection and piping. As you saw in the previous course, many commands produce output that will be displayed in a console or terminal. Actually, there are two kinds of output. We have regular output and error messages. By default, both are printed into the terminal. And there's a terminology. Regular output is going into something that we call std out, written like that, std out. And error messages don't go in there, but they go into std error for error. And it, by default, both of them are just displayed in the console. So if you have, for example, ls documenter, then you probably remember these files from the last course, then this goes into std out, which will go be going to the console as well. Now, actually, in Bash, you can redirect things. And for doing that, you have to type a larger than sign after the command. So let's say I want to redirect whatever was just the output, like this stuff, to a file. So we're going to just put a larger than, a larger than file, and I put it into a file which I call content. Now, there doesn't exist a file called content yet, so I'm going to create it with this command. And I hit enter, this time you see there's no output showing up. It's because std out is not the console anymore, but this file content. I can now have a look at this file. And you can see that our four files are printed in here, files and folders. Now colors, of course, have been lost since this is a text-only file, but the formatting is different than it was in the console. This time all these items are printed on top of each other, whereas before in the console they were at the side of each other. Now, the reason for that is because every single one of these files or folders is considered to be an item, which we call a tuple. And of course, in the console, in order to save space so that it doesn't scroll so much, uh, they put it on the side of each other if possible. However, uh, in a file, of course, it doesn't matter where you put things, and this is why they are put on top of each other in order to create uh, a better overview. Now, actually, if we'd say uh, you can you can actually redirect any kind of output. For example, there is a, a command called echo. What echo does is it just uh, returns. It just shows you whatever you give to it. So if we give it two arguments here: hello and world, and it will just print all this stuff to std out, as you can see here. We can redirect this, of course. So we can say put this to our content file, and the output is gone. Uh, it is now in the content file. We can have a look at it. And as you see, hello world is in there. But see that the previous content of it, which was the output of ls, has gone. If you, if you go our ls command again and look at content again, you see that hello world has gone. Actually, this operator overwrites whatever is in the file without even asking for permission. So it's kind of dangerous that you could maybe lose some files by overwriting them. So watch out when you use that. Now, there is also a way to append to a file. For example, if we say we want to echo hello world by keeping the actual content of content, then we can just add a second larger than sign. By having two of them, it means append to it. Again, there's no output in the console, but this time, if you have a look at it, you see that there are four files and there's hello world. Now, of course, content is not part of that since we are looking at a subfolder and content is in the current folder. Now, look, let's have a look at error messages. For example, we can have rm user bin nano. So this is an attempt to delete a file which I don't have to write. Now it's asking me, do you really want to remove the write protected file? I say yes, and it tells me permission denied. There's a way for not making rm ask for permission again. That is the F option. You'll find that in the man page of rm. So as you see, this time immediately it tells me permission denied without asking me anything. If I try to redirect this, 
You see that it still shows up in the console. That is because we have only redirected std out, but not stdr. So if we have a look at content, there's absolutely nothing in it. There is no standard output that has been produced by RM. In order to redirect this, what we have to do is put a two in front of the larger den sign. This means I want to redirect the standard error uh, output and not the standard output itself. Uh, this time it completes silently and the error message is written in content. So let's produce, uh, well, of course, there's something you probably guessed if you want to append to it, just add another one of the larger than signs. And this time it has not been overwritten, but contains both error messages that we produced once here and once there. So now let's have a command that produces both an error message and a standard output message. Actually, I can say I want to touch empty, which is just a file, empty file, and I want to remove this. This time I'm going to use a new option, which is V. V stands for verbus. It means talk to me, baby. Tell me everything that you do. So let's rm empty with this V flag, and you see that it has successfully removed empty, and it's, it's telling us about it. That's the V flag. So what you're going to do is we're going to touch empty again, since we need it. I'm going to say I want to remove force and verbus use a bin nano as well as empty now you guess it there are two messages being produced by this command one is the error message for permission denied for nano and the other one is the standard output message that is successfully removed empty so let's touch to empty again and redirect both of these so what you can say is i want to redirect the standard output to success and the error output to failed. And if I have a look at, as, as you see, it completes completely silently as both outputs have been redirected. Now I can look at the successful file. It contains the success message and the fail file. And there's the error message in it. So nothing surprising here. This is how you redirect standard output. Now, much more powerful than redirection is piping. With piping, you can send the output not to a file, but actually to another command. Now, to illustrate this, let me introduce a new command, word count, wc. I told you you're gonna, hear, you're gonna have uh, very weird abbreviations. This is one of them. So if you say uh, wc of, let's say, errors, then you can see that uh, this has one line, six words and 57 characters. We can actually count that. And there's one word, two, three, four, five, six words, right? There's five white spaces that make six words around them. There's one line. And well, we probably just gonna trust it for the, uh, for the amount of characters. Now, what we can do also is we can say, echo, let's say, hello there to something which we call a count file. This is just standard redirection. Uh, let's put something else in there. Let's say meow. And let's append it to that. So if you have a look at count file, you see there are two lines and three words. So what you can do now is we can say wc count file. And again, we see that this is correct. So this is what word country does. It indicates the lines, the words, and the amount of characters. Now what we can do is we can say we want to put ls to something we call contained. And now we want to wc this, and it tells us, well, there are 20 lines in it. So what I know now is that in my folder, which is this one, there are 20 items. If one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and this twice, that makes 20 items. So I just counted the amount of documents I have here, or, or folders, etc., by first redirecting the output of ls to a file and then counting the lines of this file. Now, that's a little bit of an overhead, and it's pretty stupid that we actually need to create a file just to count the amount of files that we have in the current folder. So what we can do is now using the pipe operator, and this is where the magic begins. You can say ls, 
gives us some output and now redirect this output, whatever ls gives us, to wc. Now this will not create a file, but a so-called pipe. Pipe is just like a tube, ls puts its stuff into it and it will directly flow to wc. Uh, not much surprising, the output is exactly the same as above. Well, of course, it doesn't indicate a file name anymore, but this is, for example, how you can quickly count the amount of files that you have in your current folder, which is 20. Now, you can redirect pretty much anything. Also, you can redirect redirected stuff. You can chain pipes as long as you want. For example, let's have a look at a website hierarchy. So. Here then, we go to the to a folder website which I created, kind of like the cook of the TV, and we can see that we have several folders here, and a lot of HTML files. Now we would like to open all the HTML files in this folder and in all the subfolders in a program called Get It. Uh, it's not installed. Let's just install it. So the zipper in for install Get It. So it's a good reminder for you, I guess, in order to install a program. And of course, it has to pull in all the dependencies as well. So now it is installed. Let's have a look at Get It. This is Get It. It's just a text editor where you can put in some things. We will not save anything here. So if you look at this, there's, there are our HTML files. We want to open them all in Get It. So what we could do is you could say Get It index.html login.html and then there's this contents thing. And you see there's a lot of more HTML files in them and I don't want to have to painfully open them all by hand. Now, if I just run this with these three files, it will open up with the three files that I am looking for. But I'd like to have a command which does this automatically for me for any HTML file within this folder. So piping is exactly what I need here. Actually, what I can do is I can get a list of all the files and folders of this direction, including subfolders, actually. Uh, there's, there are several ways to do that. One of them is find and then the dot. Find will just go through this hierarchy uh, and dot means start from here. So these are all the files and folders that I have. Now, of course, I cannot open this folder if get it, so I have to be sure that I only get HTML files. There's another command called grep. Now, what grep does, it is it filters things. It searches for a substring. So I pipe the content of file, the find to grep, and I want to filter. I want to only get things that stop with HTML. Actually, that contain HTML anywhere. And as you see now that contents has vanished and the .html is highlighted here. So we get a list of all HTML files located in the current folder and all subfolders. Actually, grep is much more powerful than that. If you read its man page, you can spend a lot of time with that. It's a very powerful tool. So now we could just word count this. Well, this wouldn't be very helpful. We cannot pipe it to get it. This is not possible. Uh, the problem for that is that get it wants these things as arguments and not as input. So if you just hit enter, you can see that it doesn't open anything. Because what we did is we gave it an input, which is a text, this as an input, and told it, well, do something with it. And get it doesn't take any inputs. What we'd have to do instead, actually, is give it arguments. So what we have is, well, I've, I've prepared a slide for this, actually. You can see that the find command produces data, which goes to grep, which produces data again. And here, we will try to get get it running. That doesn't work. What we want is we want it to give us arguments to get it. Now, there's a command called xargs, which does exactly that. Writing, for example, something like, uh, you can say, echo index.html and then pipe it to xargs and put it to get it. We actually cause get it to open a file called index.html and the reason for that uh, is that we can actually say xargs takes whatever it gets as input from the pipe 
it takes an argument, which is a command to run, and then it runs the command with whatever it got as input as arguments. So what this is perfectly equivalent to writing get it index.html. So again, echo will produce index.html as text. This is the only text it gets. Then this will be this text index.html will be piped to Xargs. Xargs gets get it as an argument and it puts whatever it gets, which is index.html behind get it as arguments, which is exactly equivalent to this command. So we can use this in order to solve our problem. We want to have all these things given as arguments to get it. Well, just type Xargs in front of get it. And the magic is it opens exactly the files that we want for us. That is very handy. This is something I use a lot in practice. Now, of course, there might be more elegant ways to do that, but this is my favorite hack with uh, piping. That's the command, that's all we have. So we can look again at this slide. Find gets me, it takes as our argument the dot. Where does it have to look from? Then it gives us output all these files which are in there. Then grep will look for this input and only get HTML files or file names names containing HTML. Give this as an output to Xorx, which takes it as an input and takes as argument get it. And then Xorx will run get it with arguments. This so arguments are green and the output is black. All right, uh, by the way, uh, you can also chain commands, like you can have uh, several commands, uh, one behind each other. For example, if we take, we want to execute Chromium and then we want to execute Firefox. We can separate them uh, by this sign, double semicolon, semicolon, and it will be run one after the other. So now it goes Chromium, opens up Chromium, and as soon as we close Chromium, the second command will be executed, which is Firefox. And it should be able, there it opens Firefox. This is one way of doing it. As you see, as soon as I close Firefox, it terminates as well. These are our blocking commands. Firefox will only be started after Chromium has been closed. This is one way of doing that. It will start Firefox whenever Chromium has terminated, whether it was successful or not. There's also another way, which is a double ampersand, like this. That means start Chromium, and if Chromium was successful, then start Firefox, and else don't do it. Now, Chromium usually terminates successfully. Of course, if it would crash, then uh, Firefox would not be started. This is something that is quite useful when you want to do a lot of things, for example, update and upgrade, like install updates and then power off. You can just uh, chain them together like this. Now, this is not piping. It's not output redirection either. It's just executing one thing after the other. All right, that's it for output redirection. Now, let's have a look at environment variables. If you know already what a variable is, this is going to be easy for you. Environment variables can be seen as kind of containers for texts, so-called strings stored in the system. Now, each variable has a name and a string, which is the text it contains. Using the name of the variable, its string can be set and retrieved from the caller. Now, I prepared a little slide for that, which is this one. You see, this is kind of a container that I made there, that's a variable, and it has a name, which we could call here favorite color. And then a content, a string, the text, which is blue. Blue is any kind of text that we can put in here. So what we want to do is we want to capitalize global variable names. Uh, the reason for that is that if you read that somewhere in a script or something, you will immediately see that you are dealing with a variable. Uh, the command actually to set the content, the text of a variable, is called export. Now let's try to do this. We can say man export. And then we get help for this export command. You see that the synopsis is as follows. You put the variable name, and then either, well, just put it like this to leave it empty, or you can say equal something. And then word is the string that it will contain. So we could try to do this. We can say 
uh, export favorite color with you saw in the in the man you saw that there is absolutely no spaces here so we put immediately the equal sign blue and now favorite color is blue we don't see anything there's no uh, no output now why did I choose blue well just because it's such a popular color let's call this our favorite color now actually we want to retrieve an existing uh, value we would like to type favorite color and see blue appearing. That's our goal now. Now to retrieve an existing variable's value, we could prepend its name with a dollar sign in any command. For example, we could use echo. Say echo. Now, if you say favorite color without the dollar sign, it will consider this to be a text and just print it. But if you put a dollar in front of it, that means go look for a variable with that name and print me the content of it. And now if there's a variable which doesn't exist, it just doesn't show anything. Now, for example, we could also say something my favorite color is. And you see that this string, which we have here, will be parsed and it's looking for a dollar sign. Whenever it finds one, it will replace whatever comes next by the content of this variable. This is why it's a good thing to capitalize our variable. So we can see immediately, oh, wait, this is a variable. Now we have a, prob we have a problem if you were to do something like that. My favorite color is bluish. That doesn't work. It's just not printing anything here because that is being interpreted as our variable name now. And that's not very helpful because our variable name is not favorite colorish, but favorite color. There's a way to tell Bash where the variable name starts. It's just we put it in curly brackets like this. And now favorite color is isolated and all this gets replaced by the content of favorite color. So if you execute this, you can see my favorite color is bluish. So we're quite happy with that. There are already predefined variables in your system. For example, there's a variable called path. So let's have a look at it. Echo path. And we see a few things here. There are several strings, several paths actually, which are separated by this uh, color. And what's interesting about them, this is actually where your system goes whenever you type a command. For example, if I type nano, your system sees there is no, no such thing as nano right here. So we go look for, is there nano in home Sandro bin? Obviously there is not. So it goes for, is there one in user local bin? There is none. And it goes user bin and there we'll find. We'll find it. So when I say nano, I get exactly the same thing as when I say user bin nano. And the path variable will actually define wherever this goes to. So be careful not to overwrite the path value. Because if you do so, well, then your system is not going to find any more commands. I tried it and actually not even the sudo is going to work anymore. So uh, be careful. Don't overwrite it. Now, actually, I want to, to take what is already in this variable. I want to add something to it. Let's say I want to create a new folder, which I call... A, let's first go home and say a new folder called My Programs, like that. So we have our My Programs folder, which is there. And I want to add this to the path variable. Now, if I wrote something like export path equals uh, what is it? I said uh, home so under my programs I would overwrite the content of the path variable this is exactly what I don't want to do so what we can do instead is we can take whatever is in path and add that to it let's demonstrate that with an echo command so we have echo and then we say we want what is in path, separated wisely with the brackets in order to be sure that it's not misinterpreted. And then the column and home Sandro my programs. Actually, if I select something, it is already copied in the clipboard and I can paste it by middle clicking. Uh, of course, I made one slash too much. So if you have a look at this, that will just give us dollar path, right? Which is that. And then it adds whatever comes after this 
to it. And this is actually what we would like doll path to be, right? Because it's doll path of what it was before, plus this folder. So we can write export instead of echo. Path equals. And I told you, uh, this dollar sign is can be used for any kind of commands. It will just be substituted by the content of the variable. So if I run this, what it does is it writes exactly this to the path variable. Now we can say again, echo path. And you see that it worked. Now I could put a program in this folder and I could just type the program's name and it would immediately execute it. So that's kind of nice. Now let's have a look at users and groups. Actually, every Linux system is a multi-user. There is one special user that you already know, which is root. Root has the right to do anything that is physically possible. As it's unsafe to do everyday operations with root privileges, you usually log into your system using your own non-privileged account. And on my machine, that is Sandro. So there's who am I? And the answer is Sandro. And you remember that you can type sue and you become root. Who am I? I am root now. And I can log back out with typing exit. Or if I go again, uh, that was wrong. Control D. And Control D will exit me out of that. It stands for disconnect, because actually what I did when I pressed, when I typed su, I opened up a new session and in this session logged in as user root on top of my existing session. This is something we're gonna do quite a, quite a lot in the next minutes. So for su, the user pass the root's password is needed. On Ubuntu, for example, uh, that won't work because on OpenSUSE root password, if you set up the machine yourself, it's the same password as yours. But on Ubuntu, it is a randomly generated password and you don't know it. So on Ubuntu, what you have to do is type sudo su. So sudo means do something with my password, then su, and that would mean then become root on, on Ubuntu, of course. On, on OpenSUSE, it works differently, you just type su. Now let's try to create a new user. Of course, we could create him here. We just go to users, etc., in the in the configuration. But we of course want to do it in the console. Now there's a command called add user, and there's one important option we want to set for add user, which is the dash m option, and this will create a new folder, which is a slash home slash uh, whatever username we are going to give it. Now let's call our user Peter. And of course you need to be sudo. Uh, sorry, the command is of user add, not add user. So sudo user add m Peter. This means create a new folder in slash home with the name Peter and create a new user. If we have a look at home, we can see that we have Peter and Sandro now. This was just freshly created by this command. And we can also become this user, like we became root before. There are several methods to do that. Uh, my favorite way to do so on OpenSUSE is sudo su Peter. So now I'm Peter. Who am I? I am Peter. And you see also that our command now starts with Peter at, use, uh, at computer name. But we are still in home Sandro. The tilde has vanished. There's no more tilde since this is not my home folder. My home folder, CD, is home Peter. I can disconnect from Peter with Control D again. And now I am Sandro. And as this was running in a separate session, uh, this command is still exactly where it was before I made sudo su. So if I go one up, it will show me up this command, which is sudo su peter. And then before that comes ls. But whatever I did as peter, of course, my bash doesn't remember since I didn't do it. It was peter who did it. So now what I can do is we can also use sudo dash u peter in order to run a command, not as root, but as peter. Remember that sudo user at, for example, runs a command as the root user, whereas with the dash u option, sudo will make us 
uh, become a different user which we can specify in this case Peter. And what you could do, for example, is say bash. We want to start a new bash session, but not as myself, but as the user Peter. And this time I am asked for Peter's password. Now, do I know Peter's password? Uh, the problem is I don't. Peter has not yet a password set. So I have to cancel this, control C, and I can say I want to set the password for Peter. So we're gonna do sudo pass wd Peter. A wd, I said. <laughs> so it tells us a new password. There was no old password. So I'm gonna type a password. It tells me that's too simple. Well, of course, for this course, I won't be typing a very safe password since I need to be able to type it fast. And if you say sudo dash u peter bash, this time we know Peter's password. And now we are Peter. And you have opened up a new bash session as the user Peter. As you can see, this does exactly the same thing as sudo so peter. But we could type anything back there. It doesn't have to be bash, it could be anything. It will just be run as user Peter. Now, actually, uh, if changing users in the console is too complicated for you, of course, you can also log out from your system and then log in as user Peter. It will show up as a normal user on this system as well, and you have a completely fresh desktop. Now, on a Linux system, users belong to groups. A group can contain no, one or several users. And actually a user can belong to multiple groups as well. Now on OpenSUSE, every standard user belongs to the group users and root belongs to the group root. Now if I want to see what kind of groups I am in, I can type groups. And it tells me I am only part of one group, which is users. Let's have a look at Peter. Groups, groups. Peter is part of the users as well. However, root, root is part of the group root. So control D again for exit. Now I can add a new group and it's analog to user add, the command for this is group add. Now for sake of a little bit later of the course, we're gonna be smart, think ahead and we're gonna create a group which we call coworkers. And let's imagine this computer is a server and I want to add all people that work with me to this coworkers group. Actually, most servers run Linux. So right now you are also learning the very basics for becoming a server administrator in case you want to be that later. Uh, so what we're going to do now is I want to create another new account. For, for example, let's call her Anna and she is my coworker. So I say again, sudo user at Anna, I want a home folder for her, M, but this time I want to add her directly to uh, the existing group coworkers. And there are two, two ways of specifying groups in user add. There's the small g, which means the main group of Anna is uh, whatever we're going to specify. I don't want that since I want her to belong to the users group in the base, but I can have a capital G, meaning I also want her to belong to the coworkers group. Now this means add a new user, which you will add to the group coworkers, for which you will create a new home folder and call her Anna. And we have successfully done it. We can become Anna and check she now belongs to two groups, users and coworkers. All right, so I want to know to, to add myself to coworkers. And that is different from what we did before since I already exist. So how do we, ex so we, do we add an existing user uh, to actually a, a group? Well, there's the command user mod. User mod adds a, a user to, a, well, does some, modifies a user, so it's called user mod. It works a little bit like user add, but with a difference uh, that it uh, modifies existing users instead of adding new ones. So this time what we have to say is capital G again. And then who do we want to modify? Sandro. Now the problem with this is that if you do it that way, it will override all the groups that I have 
by coworkers, and I don't want that. I want to keep my existing groups. So if you check the man page, you'll find that there is another option, which is A, uh, and A means append. So that means keep whatever groups you have had before and actually start and add me to this other group as well. So if you type groups, you're gonna have a bad surprise. We do not belong to the coworkers group. Uh, that seems weird. However, if we go again, if you go bash, so logging in again in this existing session, which remember user uh, sudo u peter bash, we can say just bash as I want to run it for myself. Looks the same, but I'm in a new session now. Uh, well, this is not working right now. So how about sudo susandro and groups? Yep, there we go. So. When I say sudo susandro, it will add a new uh, login for me. I'm logged in twice on the same system right now, on top of each other. And now our coworkers group shows up. And the reason for this is that changes made by user mod are only visible once I log out and log in again. So now I'm again in, in my old shell, which I was before, and there it doesn't show up anymore since I never logged out of that. Just closing the console, and opening back up doesn't help. Uh, the reason for this is because the console runs on top of this session around me. So I want to log out for good. Let's log out of here. And you see Anna and Peter are here. And I want to log in again. Now if I fire up a console, say groups, you see that a coworkers group shows up. And so now it will permanently stay there. So it's just, it, I was already part of this group, but it didn't show up before I logged out. Now I am and I stay in this coworkers group. So we have now set up a little bit more advanced user configuration in the console that would be possible in most graphical user configuration interfaces. Now. We can have a look at what we freshly created in the next chapter, uh, where we will actually be exploiting this structure that we just created. And the next chapter is going to be file directory, uh, files and directories privileges. But in order to deal with that, we first have to know how data is stored on your computer. So for that, I have made another slide, which is this one. This looks a little bit complicated. Now, you don't need to know most of that. Maybe you already know a few things of that. These are file systems. A file system is uh, whatever organizes your data on your disk. It saves, for example, what date uh, belongs to what file, like when it was last stored, uh, when it was last modified. Uh, also, it stores what directory the file is in, etc. And it even saves where on the disk your file is. Since your disk is a big chunk of data, the, uh, the file formatting, which is uh, part of the file system, I will actually remember, we'll point to the location where this file starts and tell us how large the file is. Now, there are many, many, many different file systems out there. Uh, here are six of those you might know. For example, there's the FAT32 system, uh, which is really, really simple. Uh, files cannot be larger than four gigabytes. Like this is one of the problems of the FAT32 file system. Uh, if you put on an eight gigabyte stick, uh, a six gigabyte file, and it's formed into 32, FAT32, it'll tell you there's no more space on left on device, even though you have eight gigs free, right? So the advantage of FAT32 is that pretty much any operating system and device, even TVs and so on, they support it. So that's why you probably have most of your USB keys formatted as FAT32. Now, this is not a free and open format. It belongs to Microsoft. So does NTFS. NTFS is what most Windows systems run on. But already you can see you have a compatibility issue if you try to write uh, NTFS from OS X. It will not work. On OS X, NTFS is re read-only. Uh, there is a driver which you can install. I believe it's called Tuxera, but it's very, very slow. So you have already limitations with NTFS. Now, on NTFS, uh, you will actually not have the limits of 4 gigs. FAT32 is pretty much the only system that is still in use today, which has such limitations. Then Apple users may know the HFS Plus system. Uh, this is what Apple computers run on. 
uh, Windows will not even recognize this as a file system. Like when you plug in an HFS formatted device into your Windows system, it will not show up at all. And then there is uh, Linux. Uh, Linux has a large variety of uh, file systems. For example, it supports all three of these as well, but you cannot install a Linux system on these. Suitable for installing Linux are, for example, X4, BTRFS, or XFS. So OpenSUSE, when you installed it during the install events, you probably remember you had the choice of choosing these. Now, there are even more systems that uh, Linux can be installed on. These are the three major ones. Uh, none of them are supported by either of the other operating systems. So what is interesting between those and that one is that all these support what is called privileges. Now, privileges actually define who is able to do what to what file. There's a concept of ownership. For example, I am the owner of this file, and so I don't want anybody else to be able to write to it or to read from it. Now, on a FAT32 uh, stick, this is all not possible. It supports no privileges. So that means that everything belongs to anybody who can do anything with that. So. Let's have a look at these privileges uh, a little bit closer. First of all, you have to know about ownership. Let's go back to our machine. If you touch, if you have a look at the ls command with the l option, it will not only give all the contents of the, of the directory as a list, but also it will show you some weird things to the left. Here, the first letter indicates that it's a directory. And then comes several writes. All these are writes that we can do. We're going to have a look at that just later. This is the outer of the file, and that is the group to the file. So every single file on one of these, uh, well, this is, a, I believe this is an XFS formatted device. So every single file here has an outer and group which it belongs to. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. By the way, this is the last modified date. Uh, with the exact time here. So, if I create a file as root, so I say, say sudo as root, I want to touch a file, which I call, uh, for example, blob. And we have a look at what is in it. We will see that blah does not belong to Sandro, it belongs to root and also the group root. So whenever you create a new file, it belongs to whoever created it. And now this is a problem, because if I want to write to this file, I have no permission to do so, because it belongs to root. And this is the reason why we are looking at file privileges, because many people on a Linux system, they actually create things with sudo without even knowing it or wanting it. And then if they don't know about file privileges, they are screwed because suddenly they have no permission to modify a file in their own home folder, which is kind of confusing if you don't know what is happening. So this is why we are looking at this in this course. So um, basically, we have three kinds of people. We have you, which is nice because it really is you. That's the user. It's also called the outer, but we don't call it O because the outer, the O already stands for others. So you means whoever owns the file. For, for the folder builder, for example, this would be Sandro. Or uh, for blah, this would be root. And we have the G. G stands for group. The group is what you can see here. Users, root, whatever. And you guessed it, we will be dealing with the coworkers group soon. And then there's O. O means everybody else. Uh, everybody else is people who don't belong, who are not the owner and don't belong to any uh, to the group the file belongs to. And finally, there's a little letter A, which is an abbreviation for all of them. A means user and group and others. So this is how we can refer to people. Also, there are three letters for writes. For example, there is R, which means reading permission, W, which means writing permission, and X, which stands for execute. Execute is a little bit special on Linux. On Windows, of course, you have these .exe files, and you know that these are executables. On Linux, however, for example, Nodo has absolutely nothing to it. So how do we know that we can run user bin nano as a program? 
For example, if you try if you try to run a, something that is not a program, I say home Sandro, and then for example, there's my fat blog. You will see that it says permission denied. This is because the executable write is not set on blog. I cannot write it as a program. However, if I go use a bin nano, which is the exact same syntax as you see, I just type an absolute path. It will run nano. And the reason for that is because if I say lsl on this file, ls does not only have to, to deal with directories, it can also deal with files. It will just display info about this particular file. See that blah does not have an X here. It's not executable. However, lsl, nano, you see that there are X's. It is an executable file. This is the executable write. So read or write W and X for execute. I prepared a little slide for that, of course. Um, just this one. There's a table. You can see who has the right to do something, either user, group, or others. And then what does this person have to have to the possibility to do? Read, write, and execute. For example, if we have a file with this configuration, we know that the owner can read and write. The group cannot read and write, but they can execute. And others can read and not do anything else with that. Now, what is the problem with that is what happens if user wants to execute the program, if the user also belongs to the group that is a part of this file? And the answer is, well, if you are the owner of this, you will not be able to execute a file, even if you are part of the group. Whatever matches first, starts first tries to match with owner, then with group, and then with others. Uh, if it's when there is a match, it will not go any deeper. So no matter what writes come below there, you will not be able to execute the file if you are the owner. So we can now have our love letter. Is it still there? Let's see. There's our love letter, and if you have a look at it, it is. Here. Here, we see to the left these weird things. So the first letter has either a D in it or a nothing. D means it's directory, nothing means it's a regular file. They're also different, like B for block devices or P for pipes, uh, but you don't have to know these yet. So the first three that we get are the rights for the owner, U, which is R and W, read and write. So Sandro, which is the owner, may read and write to the file, but not execute it. Makes sense, love letters sh probably shouldn't be executed. Then we have the group. So anybody in the users group has the right to read from this file. Everybody in the users group can read my love letter, including Peter and Anna. And then even worse, everybody else can read from it as well. And I probably don't want that. So what I can do is we can change that. Well, first of all, I can demonstrate that we have to write to do so. Computer. And you see that the love letter we typed in the last course can be read by Peter. Who am I? You see, it's really Peter. So let's become Sandra again. Now, what I want to do... Oh, by the way, uh, if, we go, if we become Peter again, you saw that... Uh, the people in the group don't have the right to write to it. So if you try to echo something on top of it, replacing the content of it, it has a permission denied. So that should be pretty straightforward so far. Uh, we just exit out to become Sandra again. Now the first command that I will show you is uh, chmod. Now, chmod actually helps, uh, lets us change the, uh, the rights to a file. There are two ways to change chmod. One is an absolute, and the other one is relative. Now, absolute means no matter what rights were there before, they will be overwritten by whatever you specify. And relative means that by, in regard of what was there before, you will add or subtract rights relative to what was there before. So, we can do... First time, 
the relative way. So we say ch mod. And now we can specify who. So either a for everybody, but that would include ourselves. We don't want that. So we want everybody else, others, not to be able to read. Like minus means subtract, and read write from whatever is love letter. And then we have a look at this again. We see that love letter here. The last R has disappeared. So what we can do now is, of course, say we want to subtract for the group as well the right to read, and then we'd be happy because we'd be the only ones being able to deal with that file anymore. But uh, now comes the tricky thing. We don't want to do that because we want to have a look at the absolute way to do it. Just for practice. Of course, this would be perfectly fine, but let's practice it. If we have a look at our slide again, you see that I put some number on top here. Uh, these have a signification. Actually, uh, where was that? So, 4 stands for read, 2 stands for write, and 1 stands for execute. And if you sum these together, you will always be able to retrieve whatever has been summed together by just looking at resulting sum. For example, if we have 6, we see immediately, oh, 06 can only be 4 plus 2. There cannot be a 1 in it. So this is how we can address writes in a quick way. 0 means no writes at all. 1 means just to execute, right? 1 plus 2, which is 3, means execute and write. Or for example, 6 is 4 plus 2, means read and write. And 7 means all writes combined. So what you can do is say chmod. And what we want to do is we have this uh, first letter representing ourselves. We want to be able to read and write, but not execute. So read is four, write is two, the sum of six for us. Then the second number that you will specify is for the group. We don't want any writes. And then everybody else, no writes either. And as you see this time, we are not adding or subtracting writes, but we are just setting with disregarding what was there before, do that. And you see the expected result is working fine. We get RW but not X and everybody else gets zero, nothing. So actually the relative way allows you to efficiently make some small modifications with respect to what you have before. Uh, whereas the absolute way you can very quickly set all rights for all people at once. All these nine fields shown in the slide will be set at once with just three numbers. Now, another important command for dealing with uh, files and folders. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, what, what means read and write for a folder? Actually, uh, reading a folder is pretty clear. You can read the contents from it. Writing to a folder means that you can add files, you can delete files, etc. And executing a folder means that you can CD in it. In reality, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that, but the most important thing for you to remember is that even though if, you're, if you don't have the right to write to a file, you can delete it if you have the rights to uh, modify a folder. So for example, if you have a look at the following command, ls l, and this time I added a. A means, remember, a means show everything including hidden files and, more important than that, including dot and dot dot here. So dot means the current directory. This gives us information about whatever is the current directory, which is my home folder. You see it's directory, I get the right to read, write and execute it. Everybody, uh, people in the group get the right to read and execute it and everybody else uh, as well. Now, as I have the right to write from this, I can still delete the file which does not belong to me, this one, blah, even though I cannot write to it. So if I say echo meow, uh, I think I called it blah, permission denied, but I can do rm blah. Do you want to remove write protected regular file? Yes, and it does it. So this is a warning. The file itself is write protected, but as I have to write to really do this, as since I'm in my folder and I have write permissions to that folder, 
I can still remove it. That is that is something very important. By just right protecting your files, you will not be able to keep people from deleting it if they have access to the parent folder. All right. So that is what read and write means uh, for, for for directories. Now we're gonna look at an, an imp uh, another important command for dealing with files and folders, uh, and that is the chown command. With chmod, remember you can change the writes to a file or a folder. With chown, we change the owners. Let's create a file which we call root file. It belongs to root. We just check this. So root file is down there and it belongs to root. Now we can actually move this file, rename it without pseudo privileges. For example, you could call it I own you and it's working just fine. Now this is again because we have write permissions to the containing folder. So as the name suggests, I want this file to be mine. And I also want it to belong to the users group. So there's the chmod command. Completely goes like this. sudo ch, uh, ch own, sorry. I need to be sudo since uh, the file doesn't belong to me. And I say, I want this, I want whatever comes next to belong to the user Sandro. And then separate with a column, I say whatever is the group I want to make it belong to. And in this case, that's users. And then what do I want to ch own? I want I own you to be mine. So let's have a look at this. And we see that I own you now belongs to Sandro and users, just like we specified it here. And it doesn't necessarily have to be both of these informations. I can just change the user or the owner without changing the group and the inverse. Now, what is important here is that if you just want to change the owner, you go without a column. And if you want to change the group, you have to prepend the column to it. That is how it can teleport if you are talking about a user or a group. So for example, I want to give this file back to root. So I say sudo chown root, I own you. Well, it's not I own you anymore, but if you look at it, we see that our new now belongs to root, but the users has been unchanged. And if I want to give this file to another group, for example, coworkers, what I can do is I say again, sudo chown, and this time the colon to say I want it to belong to the group, coworkers. So, and there we are. As you can see, uh, I own you belongs to coworkers and root. So since this is a rather tricky topic, let's do a concrete example for in order to reuse, uh, first of all, our formerly created coworker hierarchy, and then also uh, to rehearse a little bit of what we have learned in, this, in these two courses. So actually we want to create a sensible directory structure for our freshly started company, including Anna, and me. Now, Peter is on this computer as well, but he's not part of our company. This is why he's not part of the coworkers group, remember? So, now I'm going to create a directory which we call business. mkdir is the command for that. And I want to go in there. Of course, it is empty as you can see. And now I want to create two files. Curriculum Vitale mine and CV of Anna. As you see, both files have been created. Now the folder thing still belongs to me. Uh, but however, what I want to do is I want uh, to give CV Anna to Anna because it's hers. So what you can do is sudo change owner Anna CV Anna. And if you look at it, we now see that CV Anna belongs to Anna. The group is fine so far since we, she also belongs to the user group. But of course, uh, we want this entire directory with everything to be part of the coworkers group since I made this group especially for this directory I'm doing. So what you can do is say sudo chown. 
coworkers. And then dot. Dot refers to the current directory. And if I do that, and I have a look at everything, we see that the current directory now belongs to the group coworkers. However, the files in this directory have not been changed. Um, the reason for that is that this is not recursive. chown, if you give it here a dot, it only changes this particular file, which is in this case a folder, the current folder. But it will not go look into it and change uh, what is ever, whatever is below it. But there is, of course, uh, a way to avoid that. chown has an option which you can give it, which is a capital R. Capital R means recursive. So that means including subfolders and everything. So if you do that and we look at it, we see that everything belongs to coworkers now, except for the parent folder. But the parent folder, remember, that is my home folder. Since I am in home Sandro business, the parent folder is this one. And that, of course, I don't want to belong to the coworkers group since that's my personal folder. So that's perfectly fine. Now we want to to keep Peter from seeing anything or anybody else because, you know, this is kind of our uh, very, very top secret company. And of course, I don't want anybody else to see our secrets, not Peter either. So I want to give it to take away the read writes from all the files that we have in this folder and also from the folder itself. So let's keep Peter from doing that using chmod. I just do it as sudo, so I don't run into problems here, since there are different outers of the files. And I can say uh, a capital R, just like in the ch on command, and I say seven. For me, I want to do everything. Then anybody in the group, which is in this case now coworkers, is supposed to be able to do anything as well, and everybody else do nothing. And the second seven here will not affect Peter, since Peter is not in the coworkers group. Then again, what do I want to uh, to to modify well dot the current directory. So and if you look at this, I saw that I messed something a little bit up. Namely, what I did is I made CV Anna and CV Sandro executable, and the reason for that is because I had a seven in here and there, meaning executable as well. Now the seven was intended to be able to execute so CD into the current folder, but since I didn't look at it carefully enough, I made a little bit of mistake, I admit. Uh, a little bit uh, on purpose, I admit the mistake to, to make these files executable. And of course, CVs are not executable, so I'm not happy with that. So what I can do now is I can say that I want to... Everybody shall not be able to execute. So I take away the executable right for everybody. For what files? Well, CV Anna and CV Sandro. And remember from the last course, the RL command, we had a star, like an asterisk in it, in order to say all the files in the current directory. This is non-recursive. It just puts whatever is in it. And this does not affect the parent directory either. So the star can be used here as well. And what this does, it leaves the X for the directory, which is... Uh, dot, which is the current directory, but it takes all the x's away for CV Anna and CV Sandro. And you see that the, uh, these are white again, meaning they are not executable anymore. So the next thing is that I want to be able to write to my CV, but not to Anna's. And Anna's should not be able to overwrite my CV as well. However, we should be able to look at each other's CV. So what we can do there is I can say chmod. Well, let's do the sudo, since CV of Anna does not belong to me. I want uh, actually the group not to be able to write to anything. And you see that it successfully worked. These two W's here went away. So now for my file, I can read and write to it. But for Anna's file, who belongs to Anna, I can only read from it. I cannot do anything else. So, we're quite happy with that. Let's create a third file, which we call log. So log still belongs to Sandro and to users, since I was the one creating it. 
and we want to set all the rights at once. We want log to be non-executable for anybody. Uh, we want ourselves and also everybody in the group to be able to write and read from it. And also, uh, we don't want anybody else to see anything there. So what we can do is sudo chmod. Now this time I'm not very interested in what uh, the actual values are since I know what, it want, what I want it to be. So let's use the absolute way. So we want to read and write for myself. Makes two plus four is six. Read and write for the group and nothing for everybody else. To lock. And then we also have, well, we, we can leave it as it is. However, the group I would like to change. So ch on coworkers. And you see the log now belongs to the coworkers, still to myself, but it doesn't matter since I myself have the same rights as anybody in the coworkers group. But the cool thing about this is that if I have someone later coming into my company, for example, if Peter wants to join us, all I have to do is I have to add him to the coworkers group and he will be able to work with me just fine immediately. I don't have to change any other privileges since everything works over the group. That is why files also belong to groups. All right, now for this variant, let's test our company folder. Let's try to append something to the log. Did some work today and append it. So two, uh, two large then samples to log, that works. Say less log, read, this is reading. As you see, it works. I can edit my CV. put something into it. So that's a great CV. I'm sure everybody will be happy with it. And then also we can try to become Anna and maybe touch her. Her CV. That works as well. Oh, sorry, I have to redirect it, of course. So, and there's nothing in it, so we can just overwrite it. Now, if Anna attempts to write to my CV, there's a permission denied. And also, if I try to edit hers, I go Control D to become myself again. Try to write something to her. So this is a major sabotage. I say control O to save, file name, and okay. And it tells me, oh no, permission denied. It won't save it because I don't have to write as Sandro in order to, uh, to write onto this. Now let's become Peter. Peter tries to look at the folder and he cannot do that. The reason for this is he doesn't have the rights to do anything with that folder. He belongs to everybody else, as you see here above. He could maybe have a look at this file. Nope. It tells him it's a new file. That is because he has so few writes that Nono doesn't even know that the file actually exists. And he thinks it's a new file. And if he tried to save, save something, it tells us permission denied. That is for two reasons. One is that we can actually not overwrite the existing file. Also, we cannot write anything in this folder. So we can, for example, say touch. So we create an intruder file as Peter and permission denied. Can't touch this, not possible. We are perfectly safe. Our folder will exclude Peter from doing anything bad to us. And Anna and myself who are in the business have all the rights that we need. So we're quite happy with that. Now we're gonna show, we're gonna go back to the recording of the actual course uh, where I told a little anecdote about DD. And then also we talked about processes, which will be uh, taken from the recording as well. Okay, now let's, uh, for the last topic of today, talk about partitions. Um, who knows what a partition is already? 
quite a few. Okay, so let's not talk about this too much. For those who don't know what it is, a hard disk can be, or an SSD or whatever, can be divided into several volumes, which are called partitions, which is just if your disk is a cake, you can slice it into pieces, and every piece is then uh, called a partition. So partitions have formatting systems. If you look at the hard disk as a whole, we draw it like this. This is the entire space that we have. We can subdivide it into our partitions. Now, if you look at this partition, for example, it will not all be the data that you have. But however, what will be is that we have a part which is called the formatting. And the formatting will contain uh, indexing of your files so that we can actually find them when we type ls, etc. It will look for the data which is written in there. And then when you actually do it with the file itself and not the metadata, then you will look in the formatting, where is this? And this will be like a pointer to the destination of this actual, uh, of this actual file. So in here, for example, there will be, oh, in the folder videos, there is a file called uh, myfavoritevideo.mp4. And then when you want to open it, when you double click it, it will go and have a look. Oh, it is located at sector so many billion and million and whatever. And this is the address where it is. And it will, start, it will set your video player to start from this part where it's going to start reading it. Now, what you can do is uh, copy partitions. And this is probably the last thing I'm going to tell you today. It comes with a, a little anecdote. Well, well, so six days ago, I was in a very similar state of mind as today, meaning uh, not functional. And I use DD. This is why it's called Disk, Disk Destroyer. I don't even know the official name of DD. DD is used for a block-wise copy. You can, for example, uh, copy one partition on one device to an entire device or to another partition. Or you can say, I want this uh, USB key to be completely block by block put into a file, and then the file you can put it somewhere, you can send it over the net, and then someone else can use DD again to copy it blockwise onto another USB key. And that USB key will be the exact same thing as uh, the, main U the main key that you had here. If you send it over the internet, but absolutely nothing changed because the files uh, the, the file system, etc. everything was copied exactly as is. There's a difference. When you use CP or rsync or copy-paste or whatever to copy your files, you, sometimes you actually get a change of the owner. For example, uh, if I copy my, my home folder, uh, which is on this computer, onto a, a FAT32 formatted USB drive, it will delete all the meta information, which is about private, about um, owners, etc., because FAT32 does not support this. However, if I put my home folder, or, or if I put my home partition uh, in, with DD as a file onto that USB key, I know that it is exactly as it was in the initial state. It's really bit by bit on the lowest possible level that we can reach. Right? So that command is called DD. And DD works like this. You have DD input file equals something, which is, for example, um, you probably remember that from the install days, uh, install events, slash dev, which is all the devices I have on my machine, and then SD, which is all the connected hard disks and USB drives, etc. A, which is the main, the main disk, or the primary disk, and let's say partition number two, I want to copy this. F from here, I want to copy to where? Well, it's an uh, output file. Let's say again, dev, so sdb, which would, for example, on my machine be the first plugged in USB key. And then here, the first partition. This is uh, the way you can use it. You can also omit the one, then it will put this partition exactly as it is onto the entire device. And everything that was in the device would be completely substituted uh, with this kind of partition. And uh, as I say, substitute is overwritten. So this is the second favorite way to destroy your system. So what we did for flashing USB keys was the following. We 
we had a CD, which is OpenSUSE on them. And that CD, we copied it with DD. We said input file is the CD-ROM, and the output file is an IMG file. And then I had something like, uh, I'm just, I just pretending because I don't have it here anymore. We don't need the keys anymore. ISO or IMG, whatever you call it. Well, of course. Uh, so what we did is dd, I input file is sus.img. This time it's a file that works perfectly fine. Then of equals def sdb, which is my USB key. And of course, I have five USB ports, so I launched that. Then I plugged in another USB key, I launched this, I used that, etc. So first, Max told me you're going to destroy your computer. And I said, well, no, it's not going to happen because, you know, I'm a reasonable kind of person and this kind of thing never happens to me. So you start from B, you go on, you go on, you go on to F, and you start again. You go on and when you reach E, you kind of feel like you have completed something. And you're going to count and you're going to figure out, well, there is uh, only four between B and E and something has got to be wrong. And at this very moment, uh, with one copy progress uh, completes and then that's the moment you find out that the speed that you have had, which is part of the statistics that will be shown at the end of DD, was 300 megabytes a second. So I thought that was a kind of a fast USB key and um, yes, as I said, I have an SSD on this computer, and the only thing in this computer able of 300 megabytes seconds my SSD. And I look at the command, it looks like this. So what happened? What happened is the following. I told it. I have, this is my disk, right? It has here Windows partition, there, there it starts. And then there it has some little bit partition. And this is my big, my big Linux partition, which uh, if I lose the very first bytes of it, I will completely lose everything. So what I told it is put this ISO file onto here. And it just does it, right? doesn't ask. This destroy. And so what happened is it replaced the first 4.7 gigabytes of my hard disk by whatever was there and everything was just gone uh, in these 4.7 gigabytes and so luckily it was my windows which i don't use and i had to reinstall it there was absolutely no way of recovering any data of that it was completely deleted. this is why i mean if you ever use dd which you probably will one day watch out <laughs> all right good um now you have the choice. Um, do you want to, to make you, give you a little last exercise for the last five minutes, or do you want me to start talking about processes? Who wants processes? Okay, everybody. Wow. So we might be a little over time. Let's, uh, so who am I? I am Sandro, I think. Yes, I am. So we're going to do now is I'm going to show you how to start a job in the background. Let's just make this job a little senseless. But for example, with DD, this is great because you can spawn it and then it will just run in the background. So let's do yes and output uh, yes something and output this to def null, which is def null is kind of the trash bin on a Linux system. Whatever you redirect uh, to def null will disappear. So this is just generating text and throwing it away immediately. It's not doing anything useful. But it's a process that is running for a long time, so that's what you want. I can pause this process. Well, I can either cancel it with Control c of course. You remember that. I can pause it. The command to pause would be Control z like this. And now it is stopped. It's still active somewhere. Now I have two choices to do with that. Either I put it to foreground. Uh, sorry, I put it to, well to foreground, now you see it's working, which is FG, foreground, or of course I pause it again, I put it to background. And what happens now is that it is running, and um, you can maybe hear my computer start to do a lot of noise. It is running in the background, and I can, at the same time, I can still 
execute commands. But it's still running there. Now I want to, sh I want to, to do another one. But this time I want to background it immediately. So let's say, put it to dev null. In order to background this process immediately, I add an ampersand at the end. And it is running in the background. As you see, it got a job ID, which is two, whereas the other one got a one. If I want to look at what is running currently on my system, I say jobs. And I see that I have two of them. First one being this, the other one being that, and they have IDs. So if I go FG foreground, it will get me the first one of that, which is another. It's like a stack. Whatever you pile up, it comes back in the reverse order of what you put in. I can cancel this. I can say FG again, and the second one will come up again. Okay. Now, if I want to look at all the processes that are running on my system, not only the ones that I backgrounded myself, what I can do is top. And top is a command that will show me this. Please. What it will tell me is what time it is, uh, how many users are there running right now. There are sometimes users for sound, which are si system users, which you didn't create yourself, but your distro includes them. It tells me how many jobs are, uh, how many uh, processes are there? 134. Out of them, two are running. One is, of course, top. And then 132 are sleeping. And then there's this zombie state. Uh, if you study computer science, Mr. Rusko will teach you what that is. Uh, or, is, well, maybe Mr. Hovler. Uh, it's going to be a fun time when you have that. You can have a zombie genera generator. Zombie generator. That's going to be one task that you can implement. Anyway, so we'll see that xorg is one of the commands running, and this is just my graphical interface. And another one is uh, systemd, which is init uh, system, or here is xfc terminal, which is the terminal I'm running on right now. So let's start up a Firefox. It takes a while. So there's Firefox. Now we see that Firefox has just shown up. There it is. We see that it's taking 33% of CPU, which is a lot. Well, there it's done working. And then we see that Firefox has gotten a PID, which is 1,000. Oh, no, that is not it. It's jumping around there. 3,822 is uh, the PID. 3822. Now, what I can do is I can kill Firefox. I, with Q, of course, I can uh, quit top. So I can say kill, what was it? Firefox was 3A22. And let me maybe minimize this so that you can see here in the background, this, uh, this symbol is Firefox. If I press enter, it vanishes. Firefox has been killed. Now, contrary to, the, what is, to its name, kill will not kill a program. It will gently ask it to terminate. And then the program will eventually terminate. Now, if you have a program which is frozen, which will not uh, respond anymore, it's not going to kill it. So there's a, there's a shotgun. Shotgun is a signal which is called sick kill. Now, the default kill signal is sick term. And well, let's, say, let's see again at, at what's up with top. Oh, by the way, there's htop, which I made you all install because I like it so much. htop looks like this. It's like a top, but it says human top. It's highly configurable. It's more graphical, as you can see. Um, you can sort things by, look at these uh, commands on the bottom. Uh, they're kind of sex explaining, very nice. So now it's 105, uh, no, five fuck. Well, I can, for example, say sort by name. So wait. Well, where, where is it? Uh, priority, nah, state. Command, that's the name. So now it should be under F. Let's go down to uh, Firefox. As you see, it has a lot of sub processes which it spawned. I can kill uh, one specific one of them, which let's pick uh, 3925. Now, this time I'm going to say force it, and the force it is the nine. So so it's an option, and this option is really called 9. This is a shotgun. So 9 is scary, yes? Is easier to remember with the dash and with uh, capital letters kill? Yes, of course, we can do that too. Yeah. That will work as well. Uh, is it kill or uh, sick kill? It's only kill? 
It's cool. Okay, well, so um, this is uh, equivalent to the dash nine. Maybe you remember this better. For me, it's the nine. And the same thing as before happened, but if the command that we tried before will not work, you can be absolutely sure that the kill command will work. Except for Skype. Skype can enter then a zombie state, and you cannot kill a zombie because it's already dead. That is what I got when I Googled it, and it's perfectly correct language. So <laughs> um, let's assume you don't want to deal with, uh, with PIDs. There is another way to kill a process, but with a name. Now, we know that the process name is Firefox. Now, there is kill all. Why did it kill all the Firefox processes? Um, because this is just a thread, and when we kill this thread, the main process will be terminated as well, taking with it all the other threads. But there can be several processes independently, like if I open up a second window, it might start in another process, depending on the program, and then it would just kill that particular prog pro program. But kill all, what it will do is kill all the commands, or all the programs which are accessible under a certain command. Which here, for example, we would have uh, kill all Firefox, it's the same thing as kill without anything. This is sick term. This is a nice way. It asks all the Firefoxes to terminate. And of course, we can use again kill all with the kill option or the nine option. Okay, so this is about the most important things you need to know if you want to force quit uh, a task on Linux. Kill all minus nine star shutdown. Sorry? No. Oh, I, don't, I hope not. Let's try it. No, it does not. So um, what the star does here, it will be substituted by uh, everything that is in my current directory, and it will try to kill this, which is uh, a why it is a bad idea to use uh, star. You would have to read first the documentation, figure out there are no wildcards, no one is talking about them, and then... Go or you just try it in a virtual machine. That's, uh, that's another way to go. It's my favorite. Um, better not do it because you will kill your system eventually with that. Yes? How to kill a zombie? You cannot kill a zombie. It's already dead. To kill a zombie, you can kill its mother. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I am citing uh, the official website. And the mother of a process is whatever, pro uh, whatever started it. With HTOP, you can see a tree with F5. And there you see that the mother is here, system D, which is uh, kind of the init process. It's the one that starts up your computer. And this will start up all the other programs. For example, KDE, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the problem is when a program is a zombie, often it will be adopted by the highest process. So the mother is the init process itself. And that one, to kill it well, that means to reboot your computer. Usually, you don't have zombies. When, zom when there is a zombie permanently in your system, it means someone has programmed something bad. And except for with Skype, I have never run into this situation. <laughs> Actually, I have never run into it with free software. Skype is proprietary software, and um, most of the trouble I get is with proprietary software. Um, this is why I finally decided I would uh, go and promote free software here, because it's, it's not as much a pain in the neck as the, uh, as the other equivalent. All right. So now this is about it for what I'm going to show you today. Um, there is Christian who is coming back next week on Tuesday, and he's going to make a live hacker session. Now, you all are hackers because you have already typed in a console. Um, this is already called hacking. Uh, hacking doesn't mean anything particular. There are many, uh, many concepts denoted by hacking. One is cracking, which is illegal hacking. But hacking can also mean quickly produce code or handcrafting something as a programmer or typing into a console. So you're hackers now. Good for you. Anyway, so you can come to this course. Um, there are also our Stammtische, and uh, I have been told the website will be, be refreshed by tomorrow, I think, uh, with the newest dates. Uh, this is just get together, drink a beer, have fun. Uh, and then uh, you can also bring your computer problems with you or your questions or if you want to discuss about anything. And finally, of course, you can become a member if you want. Now, why would you become a member? Uh, I have written this down because, uh, uh, yeah, so I, don't, so I won't lose my mind because uh, it's the end. So there are many reasons why you would 
become a member of the alternative. Let me give you two of them. First of one is the Linux days have gotten bigger and bigger over the years. And this semester we had 150 people involved in this. So that's kind of a big thing. Now we still have many ways which we could go. We have by far not touched the limit of the infrastructure that we could have. So everything that is missing to us is time. And if you want to become part of this, if you want to bring more manpower into this, you can just join us and then we can go even further. We can do even more things. And for example, if you like to do talks in front of people and you think you are competent, then you can finally replace me and maybe be a little less confusing. And even if you, know, if you, even if you have no knowledge, uh, you can still come and join us. Of course, um, there are many tasks which do not require any previous knowledge. And you can come to us to learn these things as well, of course. And the second reason is if you're a doer, if you're a maker, you like to realize your dreams and you have a dream in the fields of uh, digital sustainability, uh, we have a lot of infrastructure that we can provide you. So we have a lot of contacts. We are very well tied to uh, many institutions. Uh, for example, the ETHZ, the UCH, UCH University. Then we have our Project Neptune, uh, our sponsors of us as well. Uh, in the ATH, it's the Informatik Dienste, Compi Campus, the Multimedia Services, SOS CTH, etc., etc. So an entire huge amount of, uh, of infrastructure that um, we have access to mostly for free even, and lots of people that we know. Uh, great network. So you will have all this on your side if you just come to us and ask us for it. Become a member. As a member, you have one thing that you have to do, one obligation. Uh, that is, you have to tell us if you want to leave us again so that we don't try to contact you and you have vanished, okay? That's the only obligation that you have. If you want to join us, you can do that at Stammtisch. You can do this uh, at the end of this course. Um, once we have done cleaning up, we go back to our office. And you can hug our tux if you want, of course. Uh, that would be one thing. I would need your pre-name. I would need your uh, family name and your email address. And that is everything we need for signing you up. So that's it. I hope you had half a lot of fun, which is the official OpenSUSE slogan. Thank you. Bye-bye.